Each time the choir sings that particular piece, I'm reminded of a song we sing back in Africa about this time concerning this star that shines brightly and speaks about the coming of God's son into our world. I'll just give you one stanza of that. The congregation here have heard it. Oh, now, oh, now, oh, now, yes, chapter 2. We are glad that all of you have come to celebrate with us the coming of Jesus into our world and to make us a splendid people, rising far above life's circumstances, weaknesses, disturbances, and all disturbing or heart-rending experiences on the outside, so that we may have a calm in this world that by far beats human understanding for this very reason God's Son is given to us. So one verse from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, and we are taking the 11th verse. What does it say? To you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ. And not just Christ, but Christ the Lord. What brings us together in the course of this evening? We are in festive mood, aren't we? Yeah. Yes. There's something delightful. There's excitement in the air. What is causing it? Well, we are expectant. And we are expecting it's gift exchanging time, it's family time. And who feels sad that they get a good gift or that they are in the company of those they love, especially family? Peggy and I were expecting one of our boys to visit with us today. In fact, he was hoping he would be with us in this service. But he was traveling through St. John and the storm hit the place and so he's delayed and can't be with us. You can imagine how bad it feels. He should have been here. But we're looking forward to his coming. It's exciting. I haven't seen him in seven years. Wow. Ah, you're right. My wife hasn't seen him for over a year. So we're looking forward to his coming. Let me tell you what, after the service tomorrow, we are leaving to see him. <laughs> we want to bring him over. There's a beauty about meeting family. And this period of the year tells us about that beauty. And we should be excited. And our God tells us, if we can rejoice that we have particular gifts that we value, particular relationships that we enjoy, and yet miss the source and the real substance with regard to gift giving, who is Christ the Lord, we are in error because we are actually missing that which is the cream and crown of all gifts. And see how it is announced to us. It takes a twofold pattern. For unto us a child is been born, a child a son has been given. There's been born to you. 
in the city of David, a savior. So notice, we've been given a savior. Well, 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 a savior. If we are given a savior, then we must need saving. But saving from what? I'll just test you a little. If you have never experienced any problem at all, your life has been perfect from the moment you were born today. So you can say for me, it has been up and up and up and up and keeps on going up. No down, no down and no level. Stand up, you see. <laughs> you see, that's exactly it. There is no person who doesn't experience heartache. Who doesn't experience pain? Who doesn't experience disturbance? None of us can say, we've never had that. We've all been there. And if we discount that experience, we are only being unfair and untrue and unhelpful to ourselves. And so when God sends us the Savior, He sends us one who sees the source of our problems and then delivers us from that so that he may usher us into his ability to be able to rise above these situations. Have you ever been in a powerful boat in the midst of a storm? Or when we have other storm, Arthur or something, and you're in the comforts of your home? You can hear its strength on the outside. It can rip trees apart and you can name the disturbances. Your strong house stands still. And while you are inside, the trouble outside doesn't touch you. It is when you go on the outside that the disturbances set in and problems come. And we in the world are living in that world outside of God, outside the house of God, outside the influence of God. And so we are ridden with these things that weigh so heavily upon us. And our society is not void of even young people taking away their own lives because they feel life is not worth the living. We know those experiences. We're not ignorant of how many amongst us have been seen. Oh, I, don't, I can't say that in any of you. Those who go out and take substances, drugs, memory, so that they might cheer themselves, get a little excitement, get a little happiness into their lives. We know those things are true. But this Savior comes and tells us, you may have the entertainment you want, you may have the pleasure you want. It is not only short-lived, but when you have enjoyed it for that moment, it turns and mocks you. For the depth into which we sink, after that we've pursued our own hanging pleasure, is by far deeper than the height to which the pleasure raises us. And our Savior who sees and understands our weaknesses comes to us that he might deal a death blow with those disturbances. But the question is, Will I admit to the fact that I do need a savior? Will you also admit to the fact that you do need a savior? Well, there's only one way we can do it. A doctor is useless to me when I am all right. But when I can feel... <laughs> Ah, oh, now 991 becomes very valid. I'm about to collapse here. I need him. But while that thing is pumping rightly and every piece of my frame is not, all right, stay where you are, doctor. I may go for general checkup, but just for its own sake. So if I do not admit the fact that I have a problem, a problem of making mistakes, a problem of being faulty, a problem of being weak, a problem of being disturbed, the problem of being at pain, the problem of being just this sinner who not only disappoints himself but disappoints others, who not only breaks his own heart but breaks the heart of others, who is not only a pain to himself but a pain to others. And let's face it, those of us who are married, 
How many times have we looked angrily at each other? The best friend, you, you, your wife, your husband, and you just, you know, think you're about to rip off, rip off each other's heads. And that's the best of relationships. But these are the problems we have. Disturbances that even the best of relationships. And our God is telling us, this Savior has come to correct the problem in me. So that as I relate well with him, I may relate well with me, and relate well with my spouse, and relate well with all the others. Who doesn't want that? But do we realize we need it? If we do, then we might say, but which human being has no weakness? We are not perfect. Well, this Savior knows only too well that we are not. And that is why I say, unto us is given a son. And that doesn't just say a son. It says, who is Christ. Now that word is very important because this son of God belongs to God. This son of God has the nature of God. This son of God has the power of God. And so this one who has everything that constitutes God now comes to us. And it's for this very reason that if we take him on as our savior, if we welcome him as our deliverer, if we open up to him as our help, he is what he's going to do for us. He will take that power which belongs to him, that makes him God, that qualifies him with God's son, that makes him live above sin, above trouble, above all else, and he will share that with us. For Christ means anointed with the power and presence and the ability of God. So he who saves us will not leave us to live the life we should live on our own. He saves us that we may begin to live the life that we should live by his power. In my first encounter with this congregation, I chatted with them about the ability of God to enter us and help us. You know, if you take a woolen glove and throw it over there, it will, it will be a shapeless glove. Useless. But the moment you place your hand in it, it assumes shape and strength and ability. As the hand is, so will the glove be. So wherever you turn it, it will turn. Whatever you do, it will do. Its ability lies in how much of the hand it brings into itself. If it resists the hand, it's useless. If it welcomes the hand, it's useful. And this is what our Savior is telling us. If we would open up to him, like that glove, he weaves his presence into us and becomes the ability in us to overcome those things that makes us excuse our wrongdoing by saying, we aren't perfect. I'm just weak. I'm only addicted. I'm overcome by that. There's no need for all that, because he has come to save and to make us able. John the Baptist, the writer, I know the Baptist, the apostle says this way, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, but if God's son sets you free, you will be free indeed. There you are. Will you trust him this day to do that for you? And notice that Jesus should come as a human being, the way we are, as human being, shows how much respect he has for the human being. That he should identify himself with us, shows how much care he has for us. That he should go to the cross and die, that he should redeem us, shows how much he loves us. That he should be born of a woman, shows how much he respects womanhood. That he should be born, not before Joseph marries Mary, but after Joseph marries Mary, shows how much he respects the institution of marriage, which many of us disregard. So relationships in the family, springing from spouse, spouses, build up a great society, and so God has come to redeem us that from individual, through spouses, through family, into all society, we may all be redeemed and believe this life that speaks that God is among his people to be the power in them to do what they should do because he has made them be who they should be. Will you come to this God this day? Notice how it says, he's not only the Christ, he's Christ the Lord. Yeah. So he is powerful enough to oppose anything that overcomes you and to overcome in you because he's the Lord. 
He's in control of everything. Nothing controls him. He controls all things. Will you trust him today? I pray you will. For there is born to you this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. How can I welcome him? How can I? Well, it is simple. Don't I say to the doctor, doctor, I may not knock physically, but I go to the hospital doors. That tells the doctor, I'm here to seek help. Oh, you've come to this house, so you've done well. So you've come to seek help. But the question is, will you say now, doctor, okay, I'll tell you how to treat me. Well, if I'm going to tell him, then I shouldn't have gone to him. He must tell me, diagnose my illness, prescribe the remedy, and instruct me on how to do that. And Jesus says to you, yes, your problem is you have weaknesses, and you err, you do wrong. And that is what has caused the disturbance between God and yourself. But we can take that away. For that reason, I came. For what you couldn't do, I can do. And then when I've done that, I'll give you ability to obey. And your life can change this day. Don't you want that? That's the best Christmas ever you can have. We will go out and enjoy our cakes and turkey. Our body frames will be good. But before long, like many people have done, we will fall into the sleep of death. And the food will remain, and the festivity will remain, and others will do it still who go on. But this Jesus tells us, I come. So that when you feast on me, you all come into your life. You don't enjoy me just for this life. I will take you to hope that you're looking at, hope beyond the grave. But you must have faith, the faith with which we closed our look at the readings into the advent. Will you trust God, son? I pray you will. Let's bow our heads together in prayer.